I hope that you are caffeinated and ready for the next session. We have a quick update on our polling question. Uh, our number one answer right now is knowledge management investments and subsequent maintenance effort. Show of hands, you knew I was going to do this. Who has participated in the poll so far today? Wow. So, we have a little bit of work to do there. Uh, just a reminder, you can text your uh, your response to 22333, three, three, or you can go online, pollev.com backslash argyle. You guys gonna do that for me? All right, you guys are a good group. All right, we're gonna get started with our next session. Uh, I would now like to welcome our first panel of the day, titled The Future of Customer Service, Customer Empowerment and Expectations. Today's panel will be moderated by Ian Petty. Uh, Ian is the Global Customer Care Leader for General Electric. So a warm round of applause for Ian and our panel. Good morning, everybody. I'm trying to set this. It's, it's somewhere. Great. So, um, well, hope you had a good break, and uh, and then we'll keep it to, to uh, 50 minutes before we can all have a break for lunch, I guess. So, I'm Ian Preddy. I've been working for GE for about 18 years in uh, many different roles, and right now I'm the global customer care leader for the G Water business. It's uh, an industrial business where we uh, deliver equipment, chemical services for our customers to meet their uh, different uh, water challenges. And uh, we're about two and a half billion dollar business, managing about 60,000 customers uh, worldwide. And uh, we have um, <clears throat> four different customer service centers uh, across the world. Um, and we basically, you know, we order management, billing, uh, customer master data, and about 50 different projects we all get pulled in because we're the center of the business in many ways. So uh, we've got a very interesting uh, panel, great panel today, uh, and we're going to be talking about the future of customer service. And um, the topics we want to talk about and really get your engagement and participation too in terms of what are the tactics, the strategies uh, that we are utilizing as an industry to engage the customer better. Uh, how do we look at ROI, uh, the return on investment, um, and how do we... Um, how do we look at what's, what's the future and how customer service is potentially evolving? And what, do we, what are we doing about that? So with that being said, I'm going to uh, let the panelists introduce themselves briefly and then we can uh, get started. Great. Good morning. I'm Brad Moskowitz. I'm the Director of Service Delivery for Panasonic. I've been with Panasonic for 30 years plus. I won't say how many, but it's been <laughs> my whole life. My whole career has been with Panasonic. So. I've really enjoyed working for the company in a variety of positions. Um, my role is a little unique because I have more, I just call center, um, field service, service parts, um, warranty claims. So I pretty much have the whole realm of the service supply chain. So it's the uh, position created about four years ago. So it's the one throat to choke. So I, there's no reason I can't solve any problem that comes my way. Is, is, this, is the theory anyway. So, so far I've done all right. I'm still here. So thank you. I'm glad to be here this morning. Good morning. My name is Stacey Neville. I'm the director of Voice of the Customer Consulting with Confirmit. Uh, Confirmit is a leading technical provider of Voice of the Customer, of Voice of the Employee and Market Research Solutions. Um, in my role though, I'm in the consulting uh, side of the business. And in my role, uh, which I've been in for about, th um, going on four years, um, I get to help not only set our strategy for how we go to market with our um, uh, methodology uh, on voice of the customer, mostly voice of the customer solutions, and I also get to work with a lot of our clients on how we um, put together their voice of the customer uh, strategy um, and take action on that data. So good morning. Uh, my name is Frank Schneider. I'm with Creative Virtual, and Creative Virtual is the only provider of authentic, conversational, intelligent virtual assistant technology, and we do that for the Fortune 500. And for anyone who got my microphone after I asked the first question today, I'm not sick. It's all about Villanova, who won on Monday night. I'm a proud <laughs> alum. I would wear the hat, but I know there's this calculus around what will keep me here for the day, given the type of club this is, and I figure one of it was wear a tie, and I didn't, so I've already got a strike there. If I actually put this on, I'm worried I would be escorted out, and I really want to participate in this panel because I have the best job in the world because I get to sort of speak to brands, whether or not my company's selling to these brands, and connect these brands, and talk about digital engagement, and how we get in this win-win world of, servicing our customers properly, 
generating revenue and then getting us both promoted, myself and them being the client. So it's a fantastic job and thanks for having me. Hi, I'm Lori Park. I'm the Vice President of Customer Experience for Quest Diagnostics. Uh, Quest Diagnostics is a leading diagnostic solutions provider that provides diagnostics insights that allow action to improve health for patients across the, across the world. Um, I'm in the, um, with, been with the company for 20 years, um, finance, marketing, um, general business roles, and have been tasked with really driving our end-to-end customer experience strategy and voice of the customer work to really start to, to take it to the next level as healthcare becomes increasingly consumer-driven um, in its decision-making process. Great, great. So um, thanks for all that. So we'll get started with the first topic. and. Uh, so the first question is, what self-service strategies and technologies have you implemented for customers to problem solve on their own? And uh, Laurie, maybe uh, you want to kick that off. Yeah. Um, so we, um, from a pro- just to give you a feel for Quest, is 500, we're um, large volume, high dollar um, per unit. So every night we, te- we do this testing for approximately half a million patients across the United States. Those half a million patients are on behalf of about half of the physicians across the country. And those physi- the physicians' offices have large turnover, and it results, they have a lot of questions, and a lot of times their offices are looking for the fastest way every morning to get the information they need to get those charts ready and to get ready for patients. And unfortunately, that for many, phys- many offices, that means putting a lot of phone calls in simultaneously as opposed to using self-service capabilities. But what we've um, been able to do is to really, um, by understanding um, that physician office workflow, we've been able to take and reduce, right now we're at about 33,000 calls every day coming into our office for questions to um, have transferred about 12,000 to 13,000 of those into self-service opportunities where the offices are going in and doing those typical transactions. So what are a lot of those elements? Like, hey, can I get another copy of my patient's report? I can't find it. I need new supplies. I need a new, I need a, an express pick up for um, testing because we need a, a stat or a fast test. So we're looking to move more of those into the digital landscape. And what's critical in a physician office is because of their high turnover, historically they've not wanted a lot of password level protection. They've wanted simpler ways to get to the data which is a challenge to meet that need of that cuss doctor's office while also providing the appropriate security because we're obviously highly regulated, HIPAA, it's important there. So, but we've been able to meet those, those two needs. What I'm excited about as we look forward is that physician offices are looking to get to that, provide us that next level of authentication so that they can do even more electronically. So we're right now in the process of reevaluating our entire self-service strategy to allow physicians to go even more self-serve because we think that a good number of our 33,000 interactions, probably about half of them, could move into a digital environment and really just allow us to be doing those consultative conversations every day as opposed to those, those more routine transactional. The other piece that we're seeing, so we also touch, as we said, 500,000 patients every night and increasingly Patients think of themselves not as patients, but as healthcare consumers. And right now, in the past several years, consumers of healthcare have the right to their records. It previously, you may not have known it, that you had the right to your entire medical record except your lab results. That changed about three years ago. And so now we have about two million patients that are using um, apps to download and get their lab results. So that also had been highly um, labor intensive and we're working now to meet those needs and move more of that into a digital environment. So about 300,000 patients every month are using that as opposed to a phone call to get their their lab results ordered. So we're starting to see um, some rapid changes as, as people are going through changes in how they think about healthcare. And digital is a key part of that strategy for us. This, this morning we heard a lot about, you know, the investment and how do we, uh, you know, um, finance it. So, you know, part of the, the, any investment, have you started seeing any reduction in costs? You talked about transferring some of the volume of calls to self-serve. Have you started seeing that? and? Are you measuring that somehow, and how are you, how are you going about that? One of the key pieces that we do measure is contacts into our call center per 1,000 patient requisitions. So that's a key piece. And so we're clearly looking at that, um, and we're seeing that 
contacts per requisition come to, per thousand requisitions come down, and seeing a similarly increase in those digital or those self-service opportunities, which is enabling us to um, better manage that team. Um, the other, th so I think that's been a really key piece that we're looking at right now. We're doing a lot of research to understand in the physician offices those who are at active adopters. Why do they love it? For those who go on both. Actually, the ones we're really targeting now is people who call some days and use digital the other day, self-service the other days. We're finding it's who's working in the office that day and does that person more comfortable. So I think clearly we know that as we can move more into a self-service environment, we're seeing the reduction in that incoming volume, which is allowing us to be more cost effective. And it's improving their satisfaction and their stickiness. Okay, great. I don't know if anyone yeah, in the yeah, panel you, has you know, I'm curious, you know, when, when Schneider Electric presented um, one of the tenets of meaningful connections for them was speed and accuracy, right? So, so get it out there quick. And I, I imagine with you, it's for the patient or the doctor, it, it's ultimately there's sort of this speed element to getting that information as quickly as possible. But how, I'm curious to know how much, in regards to these solution investments, to this digital landscape, how much speed and accuracy, not just for the answer or the piece of content, but for the ability to pivot. Because in your world, whether it be regulatory compliance or the needs of the customer, or the type of customer, or um, new things because of the Affordable Care Act and how that trickles down into pharmaceuticals or, or diagnostics. You know, how much is that speed element or that velocity of being able to react to what you're seeing in the tools affect you know, both your investment and purchase and also you know, the ability to sustain the ROI and keep moving it forward? I, I think the ability to move quickly is really important. I mean, I'm going to be pretty honest, though, like a lot of healthcare providers, we're still looking to change our underlying core systems mm -hmm. to allow us to be much more agile and make those changes the way consumers think about things, right? Mm -hmm. I think of it in two week updates, right? I'm getting an update to my app every couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. A lot of healthcare, ourselves included, we're not we're not there yet, but we right. believe that's an important element to be able to respond quickly mm -hmm. to that feedback and those changes that they're looking yeah. for. Yeah. Makes sense. I think um, I'll speak on behalf of some of our clients um, who are going through something similar. And similar to you, we have some clients in um, healthcare, animal healthcare, et cetera. So they're they're also struggling with the need to be able to provide self service um, options. And and they're they're typical, their <coughs> online um, ability to change information, get billing. Um, information, FAQs, things like that. So they're struggling with the ability to um, take complex questions and issues and be able to put them online. Um, and, and they've been successful with some of that, but what they've seen and what most people think is when I'm, when I'm able to do that, when I'm able to transition those calls to be online, I'm going to reduce the number of calls coming into my contact center and thereby reduce my costs. Um, and while they are reducing, so they're, they're watching the number of calls, they're reducing the number of calls coming into the contact center, so there's a, a win there. But the, the cost per call may actually be going up because they're getting more complex mm -hmm. calls. Mm -hmm. um, in, so it's, but they're also seeing it as a win. So what they've had to do is kind of re think, think about um, the metrics that they're using to measure success and measure um, what, is very val what is valuable to their customers. So they're getting, they, they've kind of cleared the space to be able to get those more complex calls, solve those more complex issues um, and solve them at a higher level, solve them at a more strategic level. So there, there's a bigger win involved there. Um, while the cost per call has not necessarily gone down, the success uh, or the, the ROI is for fixing these bigger, more complex issues has actually gone up. You're being more consultative as opposed to transactional. Exactly. exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems that as we develop the tools and self-service models, we need to start developing the way we look at ROI, how we measure it, what data we need to capture, and maybe what tools we need to develop alongside uh, the self-service tools. Okay, so um, <clears throat> following this up, what tactics have you started to use in terms of bringing the, the tech-savvy customer in and starting to learn from what they need and what their experiences are to, to, to give them a better, richer experience? And um, I don't know, if Frank, you want to? Oh, sure. You know, um, <laughs> you know, much of my experience, again, is, is presented as consulting with brands as opposed to my own company. And in the last 24 months, two of my favorite are two on the surface what appears to be very divergent clients that we worked with. And one is a really large cable company, um, and one is a very large hotel chain. And what was interesting to me is to notice that meeting customers at all of these digital moments of truth and tracking them beyond proxy data or just simple sort of clicks and things like that, but actually making it meaningful is really one of the crux of how, how do we balance sort of adopting 
digital strategy and also tracking against it and dovetails back to sort of the ROI. And what, what we've found is that in talking to both these brands, the, the key obvious point of today's panel maybe in some ways, even though digital isn't the title, is that you can win on customer experience and more specifically you can win on digital experience. Um, when I think about Schneider Electric sort of stating that, you know, this, this is where we all need to head. Really, we all needed to head there maybe 10 years ago, you know, if I might be bold. So, so now it's about you know, how do we continue to refine and improve? And for this one large hotel brand, um, you can go to their website now and their customer care page is gone. And there's just a nice little inviting ask that says, hey, need help? Because ultimately, you know, when I think about Brian's presentation from Comcast, that idea that we're all connected, we're sort of tied to this mountain together for internal stakeholders, I think it transcends also with the customer because when I, I'm an IHG Rewards member, and, and when I want to use this hotel brand, or I'm also a Hyatt Rewards member, there are certain things that I want that I expect our KPIs to dovetail and, and connect and say, yeah, I want this quickly too. And, and if you give that to me, you know, it, you, I'll reward you with my loyalty, and I'll also convert more. So what we found of both these brands is sweeping out sort of older, more traditional methodology around static content with proxy tracking and having something more engaging from the beginning, more conversational, that is friendly in tone, conversational in nature, even in a digital sort of typing channel, and then aligning KPIs to say, well, what do we want from this customer when they come here? Well, they have a problem, we want quick, re quick resolution, we want them to not have to, if they do cross channel, have much pain with the interaction. Mm -hmm. And the, I, the sort of hotel brand we found was much more diving headfirst into it, when you might think they have, might, might have more at risk in regards to hospitality, even than a more traditional cable brand, where, where the cable brand we worked with also was innovative, but in a way that was kind of like, we need to turn this around. There's Saturday Night Live skits making fun of our customer care. Um, what is the way we're going to lead? And to the point where they're doing literal TV commercials about this new digital approach that are very self-deprecating, but also saying, hey, here's our new way to handle you. And, the core at both was, it's not a risk to meet someone at a digital moment of truth and say they want, customers want to adopt these technologies and you have to kind of keep it simple and say, let's make it conversational, let's give the customer a chance to tell us what they need um, because you'll get that and be able to improve quickly over time. That's, no, that's good. I mean, yeah. the, the follow-up question would be, mm -hmm. have uh, some of your customers or, or yourselves have you um, differentiated the different approach, even within a customer base, maybe t towards different segments that they have? Yeah. How, how, do, how do people look at, look at that and how they approach it? You know, I think the key, you know, it, it's easy to just wrap it in the wrapper of personalization, um, but any time that you can show the customer the respect of saying, hey, I know this much about you, in not sort of a, a creepy, intrusive way, like, hey, I saw you liked Villanova <laughs> on Facebook, I don't want, Love you, Comcast. I don't want you to tell me that you knew that, but I would love for you to tell me, hey, you got your X1 router like two months ago and you still haven't hooked it up. Well, you know, or your X1 pack. Why haven't you? You know, and my wife keeps bothering me, you know, hook it up, hook up the X1 package and we get to talk to the remote. There's all this cool stuff. Isn't that what your job does too? You talk to things and it, and it helps you. Um, you know, if you actually take the time to, to sort of you know, listen to your customers and say, okay, well, you know, let's meet them at this point and help facilitate that, um, you know, we, we find that's key. So, so knowing who I am, knowing the type of customer I am, what package I have, and leveraging that context to make this tool, whatever it is, digital engagement or even an agent, to respect me by showing the intelligence that you know me, uh, makes a big difference. So we, we try to enable that with our solution in particular, but this is something I think all brands are hungry for, yeah. and, and it's key to ask the right questions of whether it's a technology solution or an initiative, simply a strategy. Are we able to do this? Are we inspiring trust? Are we allowing people to get the outcomes they desire? Is there a win-win component for our customers? And are we showing them the intelligence and respect that the customer deserves? Yeah. And I guess some of the challenges, some businesses know how to approach those questions and some need a bit of help, I guess. Mm -hmm. Laura, you want to? Well, yeah, because I sit here and think about the question too is talking about our technologically savvy and I think where we're sitting and spending a lot of time is how do we get to those who are the least technologically yeah. savvy yeah. and to get point. them to be moving mm -hmm. into a self-serve environment. For mm -hmm. us, our least technologically savvy tend to have the lowest volume with us and require the most care. 
So those are the ones that we're looking at. How do we get to understand them better and how do we get to pull them into using yeah. some of these tools? To your point, they want us to know them, but they're oftentimes a little more technologically hesitant. Sure. So that's, those are the pieces that we're really working at right now because our most savvy ones are the ones already who are taking the least amount of effort from us. Sure. Sure. Yeah, we found the key to that is you got to make it simple, right? Easy, right? The easier it is for Easy. a customer, that'll kind of tend to you know, mitigate their reluctance to try to use the self-help. Because if there's nothing worse than going to a site and you can't find something, you know. I'm curious, have any of you messed with sort of customer effort score as a KPI? Yes, we, start making yes easy? we have. And, yes. and, and how have you been tracking that? And how have you seen trends? And what have you done to sort of... Well, the customer efforts score, we kind of changed because it, it was totally the opposite of what everything else was done because we typically do an MPS. So the mm -hmm. low effort score was give us a one for easy, right? And so people would yeah. get confused as whether one point. is good or bad. Or, yeah. So it kind of really ruined our, it's we don't know point. if it ruined our results because <laughs> it's, we're either really bad at the low effort or the people don't understand or some combination of both. So yeah. uh, we actually changed it to be the same as the NPS. So th and we're trying like that. to see yeah. that because it's just a But the challenge interesting with, with some of those, at least we find, is that our our, our, I guess our, some of the our high, high contact physicians who are not, is that they perceive it's easier to put multiple phones on speaker and to be sitting and waiting for an agent. That is perceived oh, wow. Wow. to be easy for them. And so what we're wow. getting trying, so even if we talk to them and talk about, you know, show the time, how it's faster, how we can build the savings, it's not, it doesn't feel easy for them. Hmm. So it's interesting. So that's where we're actually going is to, is to overcome for people that their processes have been in the morning, I'm going to call three different companies at the same time and get what I need and, and have you queued up. Hmm. So it's, it's interesting as we look and we really understand, like we, as the Schneider, to say, what's that? How do they really need? What do they need to go over? And that's where really where we're spending our time now is how do we start to flip them? And that's where I'll be spending a lot of my next couple of weeks is spending time in those docs offices watching them and really talking to them. I think to your, to your point earlier about um, sometimes it depends on who, which, which nurse or doctor is in the office at the time to make the call. Some of it is, and we've done some of that with our, our veterinarians and looking at that, it's who finds it easier to self-serve off hours? Who finds it easier to make that phone call in the yeah. morning? And it's really being, being able to personalize and segment your customer base and understand what makes each one of them tick and then per, you know, go after and make it easy for, for those folks. I think uh, for some of our clients are getting off of the you know, animal health and things like that. We have a lot of insurance clients. And so that, that's another one of those practices that um, like financial services, um, we, there are a lot of regulations um, and, and are reluctant to sometimes move into the digital age. Um, or perceive that they have customers that are reluctant to move yes. into the digital age. So some of that perception is not just on the customer end, it's also within um, your back offices, yes. your, your, um, or your, your sales, companies, or your that team. perception that our, our customers don't use social, our customers don't use apps, our customers aren't digital. Um, and that's simply not true. Uh, and and we, we started doing that just by tracking demographics, tracking so things like customer effort score and net promoter, but, but looking at where the feedback is coming from. Is it coming from a computer? Is it coming from um, a tablet? Is it coming from a phone? Um, so because we can track where the data came from, where the feedback came from, we can say, well, this age group is actually you know, rising year over year over year on tablet usage, on phone usage, on providing that feedback um, in those ways. So yes, they're ready to join that digital age, so let's meet them. Yeah, point. it's interesting, when you speak at sort of less tech savvy customers, I think about, you know, if I could, not that I'm allowed to take a poll on the panel, but when I think about who's texted me in my life, you know, you can mentally raise your hand if your parents or your grandparents have even texted you, and I can definitely raise both hands for yeah. Great aunts, my grandmother, mm -hmm. have all texted me, and, and it's gotten to the point where that's a viable channel to meet people with this sort of alternate strategy of saying, um, you know, I think about who texts me every month. Wells Fargo texts me every month, and Verizon Wireless texts me every month. And when I get this text, it, it, it's usually informative, it sort of knows something about me, and it's an invite potentially for me to engage or buy or consult with you, and it's so rarely almost never to this point, I'm hoping to change that if I'm lucky, um, it's not often bi-directional. You know, if, if Wells Fargo, if, if Verizon says, hey, they, they texted me today, you're killing your data while you're traveling, you're gonna bust it open, it's $20 more a month, and I really wanna ask them, um, hey, 
does this change my contract or um, can I also buy this? And once once you've done that invitation, you know, you got to kind of give your customers credit. So so you know, I, I feel like my grandmother who just went through sort of you know liver surgery would gladly take her lab results. Now there's all kinds of HIPAA things, so I'm getting a little bit crazy here. But if she could somehow at least know they were ready and get that in a text, she would never call in and then she would figure out what it was to get that. I totally agree. It's finding that piece and pulling them along the journey. And that's really what we're like, how do we bring you along the journey? Because I think as you were mentioning is we're seeing pieces evolve quickly from physicians two Mm -hmm. years ago who weren't ready to now they've leapfrogged Absolutely. others yeah. because they yeah. watch the pieces so it's yeah. us making making those moves with them that's cool yeah so you you guys started talking about the next topic so, <laughs> so you're ruining my plan here but um uh, the key performance metrics but you know you've talked about you know effort scores and mm-hmm. things how about you know cognitive analytics and how is that you know coming into the play in terms of how we're using the data how we're predicting <laughs> customer behavior things like this are, are you guys already doing some of this? Is it too early? You know, there's a whole, I think businesses here are already starting to, um, to, to look into that. I don't know if uh, Brad or... Yeah, that's interesting. We kind of do... Um, we have an all of the above. So in my, in my case, there's, you know, because I have different responsibilities, we have metrics for the call center, which are pretty much, you know, the standard. Everybody's measuring AHT and things of that nature. Um, we have web-related activity as, you know, how well we're doing, our customers think we're doing, what kind of activity we're having uh, from a service standpoint. Um, we have actually have some cases where we can react to customers and we try to respond to them within a certain time period because we're getting uh, information and can communicate with the customer. And when you can call somebody within a half hour or something of a problem, um, that makes a really big difference, right? Because most people who are complaining aren't expecting to get much if ever, I, I rarely get one. If you complain about something, you rarely ever get anybody contacting you. So uh, we try to do that on a service standpoint. It makes a pretty good, pretty big difference. Um, on the social side, it's kind of interesting because our sales company normally drives the social, um, except when it relates to customer service. They don't want to respond to anybody, right? Yeah. So um, we call that protecting the brand, right? Because they like to do some, you know, some good stuff and you know, good things about the product. But if anybody wants a response or a, even a, uh, um, I, boy, I just lost my mind here. <laughs> <laughs> a uh, product preview, right? There you go. Demonstration. Yeah, product review. I was trying not to say the company. So, product review. Um, it's all on the customer side, so we have to do all the responses for the social, and, and again, that's more of a, it's, it's protecting the brand, and I guess for this, the lack of a better word, because you can't afford not to do something, right? If you have somebody complaining or some issue that somebody's uh, spouting about and it really gets big, you know, a lot of people see that, so we have to at least protect the brand. So that's, that's a pretty big issue for us. And we do a lot of, um, I'll say, cognitive issues with our uh, customer care. We try to break it down for product incidents and all the different reasons people are calling I mean, to, to, the, to the ridiculous, to the absurd, and, right? And then you look at all this and you say, okay, so what, was, what did that say, right? And you look at it and say, okay, all right, let's move on, continue on. Uh, so you might get a few pieces here or there, but... Um, we're really working on the social media and side of the business to try to improve that from our standpoint because it's it's where you can have the biggest biggest single plus or minus you can you can do positive stuff and negative you know responding to negative stuff on social media has the biggest impact so yeah. that's where we're looking so. you know we, we obviously spend a lot of time collecting and analyzing um, uh, voice of the customer, voice of the employee metrics. Um, but wh- where the rubber hits the road for us is being able to marry those metrics with the, the internal metrics. So those internal pieces that you're using to, to manage the business, to really um, understand uh, first call resolution and things like that. Not always from the customer's perspective, but from the business perspective. And um, one of the ways that we also help do that is, um, we've seen a lot of clients using this, is with tech, um, sorry, tech analytics, um, voice to text or tech analytics, and really being able to utilize the customer's voice and tr- turning that into a quantitative analysis. It's kind of, we've always asked those open-ended questions. We've always asked the why 
the you know the, the deeper dive questions. But um, I think it's the, you know as as time has evolved, I've been doing this for a really long time. Um, uh, over to use it over thirty, yeah. over twenty. Um, I'll just leave. The, the actual number out, but you know, back in the day when it was phone surveys and you had people on the phone asking and probing and getting the the the, the deeper dive information you need. Now it's text, email, web. Um, there's no one on the phone to say, "Can you tell me more about that?" So those text analytics, those 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 um, open-ended text boxes, sometimes they're full of rich data and sometimes they're not. So we really have to find ways to try to comb through that. And I think for for a little while, we've been, um, you know, text analytics was cost prohibitive for a while, so we, we've been struggling with the how do I really deal with this volume of random words that are that are out there. So I think that there are a lot of great text analytics um, and sentiment analysis that are that are going on now. So we're able to take that that data, turn it from qualitative to a more quantitative measure, um, and then go find the qualitative when we need to. Then then dive into okay, what did that actually mean, and what was the sentiment behind it? Um, but I can yeah. use some segmentation to get down to that. Well, and it's like, well, we're at the point right now is we're building to bring in those pieces, but to build it in with other elements that maybe we hadn't married with it with before. So our executive complaints go in there. The next thing we're going to bring in is our salesforce.com call. We're going to bring in our salesforce call notes from our, we've got at this, we've got almost, we have 1,800 sales executives around the, or around the country. I want their call notes. That, that's because when I call customers, sometimes I'm told, Talk to the rep. He knows what I'm thinking. So I'm like, I want to start mining those right. notes That's and combining great. them with other areas that I think those will be able to allow me to do better predictive analytics. Yeah, what, what makes me optimistic as a consumer um, is that when I heard Brian speak at Comcast and even hearing what's coming out here, this idea of not just voice of customer, which I think everyone's been sort of touting VOC you know, for a little while now and trying to get there, but voice of employee, and for us it's even voice of the call center agent. You know, it's even as simple as, like you mentioned, just sit with an agent. You know, I remember when, and I'm sorry if anyone's here from Discover, because I think it was almost on point, but remember those commercials where the, 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 call, the, the person calls the call center rep with an issue and it's like their twin, and it's like trust someone who's just like you, and I always, I, for me, I was always kind of like, I just want my issue resolved. It's cool if they like a tribe called Quest, but I don't want to talk about a tribe called Quest on this call. I really just want to know my APR or whatever the and case may be. Done. Yeah, exactly. I want it done. What I do really like, again, that theme that Brian had with the connection, right? I, you know, the Android commercial together, but not the same, right? Where you have all the different sort of elements of Android. You know, all these people have Androids, but they're not you know, the, the same exact person. And that's the commonality. The agent also wants to hit their metrics. And believe me, I was an agent. I'm going to game the heck out of my metrics if I figure out an easier path there. But ultimately, if I'm an ethical, good agent, which I think I was, I want to help the customer's problem. And the customer also wants that help. So, you know, if you're able to take that approach and just sit with your agents and say, how could we have better solved this? That VOA, that voice of the agent, there's some real gold in there um, on top of voice of the customer because they're way more aligned than, you than maybe we think. Um, so to hear these thoughts all day, it, it makes me feel optimistic about where we're headed. Okay. Quite frankly, that's, um, you know, we, we've done a lot of that. We call it voice of the customer through the employee. Um, we've done a lot of that work because, you know, if, if you think about building up your employee base and really understanding from them um, what their job is like and also empowering them to do their jobs. Part of that is asking them, well, what do you hear? What, what are you getting from your customers, whether it be your sales force or your agents on the phone? Um, they hear a lot of the complaints, the, the, um, the kudos. So the, giving them the ability to also lend an ear to that metric, to yeah. say, you know, I saw a peer do something fantastic. Uh, I witnessed a, an issue or a concern with a client, and here it is. They're, they're, they may not fill out the survey, yeah. but I can give you that information. An agent employee empowerment exactly. is customer empowerment. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's sort of being the advocate exactly. for the customer. For Agents love to be able to be an advocate for customers when they can, if it's enabled. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we, in my business, we have a similar issue where we're trying to get the, the right data in the hands of the agent to give the best answer so that the connection you're talking yeah. about mm -hmm. is about not so much that it would like the same, but it's more about do I know what's going on in your world yeah. and can, can I anticipate the yeah. issues because exactly. I know you called and yeah. I'm not repeating the same thing 10 times. Yeah. So what are we doing about trying to connect the data? And obviously there's probably providers out there that yeah. will talk to us, but um, what are we doing about connecting the data in a, in a more efficient way, less data crunching and you know, that big cleanup exercise that we'll, we'll uh, hate. So I don't know if you, any of you have any experience around that. 
I was going to say, we're still in, we're in the process, and it's, it's slow and laborious. And I was in front of the CEO yesterday saying it's taking longer than we thought. It's, it, it's especially because we're trying to marry up medical, clinical, clinical results with other, all these different elements. It just, it's, and we've got outside advisors, great advisors, but it's slow and it's hard. And you want it, I want it done right. I was going to say, I'm going to go for getting it right as opposed to getting it fast. Yeah, and I think it goes back a little bit to what Iran was saying about how do you get um, this sort of issue at the board level so that they really understand the implications and you do get funding and you, get, yeah. you do get support um, to go and do these tasks which have seemed just a cost because you need resources and investments to, yeah. to get it done. And we've almost seen sort of a, you know, alignment and almost, I don't want to say a backwards approach, but starting with the outcome you desire and then having that inform are you even tracking the right data? Metrics. Because it, in, in the world of APIs, which I know enough about APIs to know that they make everything possible, they're magic. Um, but you know, we can go push and pull and grab and connect and push things into data warehouses. You know, it's very pliable. And, and if, you're, if, if you're dealing with vendors or internal stakeholders that they're not, you win that battle with the outcome approach, right? Yes. You say, well, this is what I need tangibly, and this is how I get there. So we're either opening up that API or we're going to write a line of code and we're going to get it done. Um, but ultimately, it's once we figure out where we want to get to or where we hope we can get to or have a hypothesis, then we can decide, is this data that we're tracking even worthwhile? And do we need to shift that? And, and what enables that, you know, and, and what we've seen is this idea of having everything in the customer journey be able to be connected is key, right? And it's, it's common sense. Mm -hmm. We've all been talking about this and wanted this for a long time, and it's, it's here. It's here now. Because the ultimate goal, at least yeah. for us, and it goes back with our commercial team, our ultimate goal is how do I retain the customers I have and grow right. new customers, mm -hmm. and how do I retain my employees? Yes. Because oh. those are the two pieces that it all comes down to, because it's... In, in all of our business cases, go back to those two golden metrics. If we're not, if, when we look at things, yeah. like Brad said, just make it easy. Mm -hmm. It's make easy for your employees and your customers. Right. Everyone's staying and happy. Hopefully, we actually <laughs> kind of changed our focus from trying to have the ultimate database to having a, a person or a group that actually goes out and gets all the data and puts it all together. Nice. Right? So yeah. there's, it's an it's an internal job, a position we created just so we can stop the endless cycle and cycle of trying to have the, the ultimate mm -hmm. database that never ever happens, right? Because nobody ever agrees on what that should look like and who's going to do it and what's it going to cost. And, it's, yeah, who can so, touch it? So we have for a, specifically on the service side, there's a group that just specifically focuses on that so they kind of take some of that away and that's, that's helped it, a lot. It's a, it, it's a big deal. You know, yeah. we, we take a really kind of cheat. I call it cheating. No, I, 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 think it's, I think it's responsible. I mean, uh -huh. I, I think I like that, but that's it, good. It, I really believe that. You know, I see commercials on TV again where, you know, there's machines having, helping Bob Dylan write songs and, and also telling someone how to raise kids, a social worker, how to take care of kids. Or, and I'm kind of like, wow, are, are machines getting to that point? To remove the human curation element, to remove the idea that it requires someone with skin and bones to then say, okay, how do we apply this properly, you know, is a key component. And if you're already realizing that and you marry that with the right kind of technology investment, it's not cheap, it's, it's the right approach. It's you know, I can't approach. back that up enough. I think to, to also piggyback off what both of you were saying is it's, it's, it's slow, but mm -hmm. it's not impossible. Yes, APIs yeah. make a lot of things possible, but, you know, it is slow because not only do you, you still need to know your customer and you need to sure. be able to marry the journey yeah. um, and get your customer through the journey. So very often we see that we don't necessarily have that unique identifier that matches what they did here to what they're doing now to what they may do in the future. So we've got to start to think from the end point, okay, how do I go apply that going forward? How do I make that system? Because right now that may not exist. Um, yes, those, those APIs and databases exist to be able yep. to marry all of this data. The question is, do we have the data to be able to marry? And that's what we have to start building and, and looking forward to um, and probably reverse engineering. And a vision of what you're going to do with it. You talked about the functions, taking away those functional silos mm -hmm. and thinking about the journey and functions, but thinking about mm -hmm. it across the end to end. Absolutely. Which for us has been a, a change that we've embraced which is historically not the way we've been working. We've been working our, like many, many organizations. We optimize functionally. Yeah. Absolutely. Cool. I think we have time for one more question, and then we'll hopefully we'll open up to the floor. So um, how have you seen the role of customer service changing, uh, and in particular with, with all the new technology that we're trying to drive and everything we've talked about today? 
Anyone? Uh, it was a bonus question I threw out there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that the, the role is changing in a lot of ways, but you know, not necessarily specific to technology. Um, there's an elevation of the role and elevation of the, the concept of, of customer experience. Um, so you'll, you're seeing investments being made with um, CCOs and you know, new directors of customer experience. And that's, you know, 10 years ago, this did not exist. So we're just seeing a focus on, on putting dollars and, and focus and attention and even C-suite attention on customer experience. So I think that um, the, the rest of it, the, the, the technology, the marrying, the journey, all of that follows the focus because we now have a seat at the table to talk about the actual customer experience. So I think there's a huge investment being made in um, the roles, the people. Um, you hear a lot more talk about things like customer journey mapping and empathy mapping and putting yourself in the shoe of the customer. Um, and, 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 and I heard it this morning, not just what happened when we picked up the call, but what happened when they woke up in the morning, what happened to, until they went to bed at night. So it's, it's the ends that aren't necessarily within our our, our, our reach, what we think, you know, when, when you make an insurance claim, insurance companies typically would think that, um, you know, our process starts when we pick up the phone. No, the process started for your customer when the tree fell on their house or they had the car accident or their doctor told them something was wrong. That's when the process started for them. The process, you know, and it, and it had been going. So what we have to do is start thinking about how do we help navigate people through that process? Or how do we help them pass when they hang up the phone or when we paid the claim? How do we continue to How do you continue to have that interaction, that dialogue? Exactly. And that's the, yeah. that big piece. And I think we found for us that's been critical is even changing the nomenclature in the organization mm -hmm. to we were talking very clinically and we're still in it, but let's stop talking like clinicians unless that's how they want to be spoken to, but let's actually sp speak to people in the language they want to be spoken mm -hmm. to. And for on some of our call center, they, that's, the pr approved, that's the preferred approach. But if I'm a phlebotomist caring for a patient one-on-one, -on -one, they want a different feel and they want a different language set. And that's, to your point, it's changing and meeting that customer how they want to be met. So I think, I think about investments around and the way we look at an elevation, you know, customer care and that element is one piece of it. It's that whole end-to-end -end and how we're looking at all of those investments linked together. I mean, I mean, ultimately, without being too corny, you know, ultimately technology is always supposed to improve our lives throughout yeah. history. You know, any advancement is supposed to improve our lives. And so we're at this interesting place in customer care in regards to empowerment where the expectation, given just our nature of, you know, watching something on TV, maybe DVR into other things, holding an iPad in one hand and also maybe text messaging in the other, you know, it's created this ADHD craziness, which I won't dive into, but it's also created this sort of expectation of access. Every, I have to have access to you. It has to be instant accessibility. You know, the SLA in our personal lives for response time is so different than it used to be, and we're constantly relearning what that is. And so, you know, I always kind of, one of my least favorite things is X is the new marketing. Customer support is the new marketing. Customer experience is the new marketing. Well, you know, there's always something is the new marketing. You know, it's, it's common sense that we need to meet our customers at all these moments of truth, and we win their hearts and minds by actually meeting them intelligently and being accessible and instantly available and giving them as much help as we can. And, we'll, and we can, and when we can't, actually saying, hey, we can't right now, but, but here's saying, how we can fix making it. Making that no feel like yeah. a yes. Yeah, exactly. Right, and that's exactly. actually, yes. <laughs> yes. But, it's, it's, but it's not a no, it's, it's Here's an alternate scenario. Here's an alternate yeah. scenario. We can't do what you yeah. want. It's why we can't do what you want. But how can we help you meet what that need is? And, and what makes me optimistic again is that when the customer says, nah, I don't like your alternate choice, we now live in a world where we can actually say, hey, based on this feedback, we need to do X. And brands are starting to do it. And, and technology is meeting that. That's where technology comes into play for me is I do think we are, are at a different point. The technology it's, can enable that. The right technology with human intervention. It is it's more experiential, right? Yeah. And with all the new tools and stuff, customer <laughs> reps are going to have to do more, do different things differently, yeah. right? So they might have to do phone, chat, social, things all related that they didn't have to do before selling things. Revenue, we're starting to do revenue as well. And it is a different, it is a different mindset. They're almost so, needed more because when it comes time that my expectations of consumers, now the phone call is happening, that thing has to be on point. Because I've probably been to the website. 
I've probably already tried to self-serve. I might have even hit you up on Twitter and annoyed you. And now I'm speaking to an agent. That agent has to be an incredible rock star, star, right? So we have to enable that agent and allow for that voice expectation to be married. And ultimately, if I can avoid the phone call for me, it's just my nature, um, I also reward your brand because, hey, I got to be able to meet you somewhere else and get it done. So one of my favorites earlier this year, we had a customer who, uh, it was a patient, who um, didn't get his results as quickly as he expected them. And the root mm -hmm. cause was he used two different names. So when we're doing a, a three-point match, we couldn't match him. But he was so angry that he booked every one of our appointments in the PSC closest to him oh, for three days. So we found an issue in our software that we fixed right away. But he posted pictures of our empty PSC on Facebook. Well, we looked at it. We figured out he was the what, he, what the problem was, what what he had done wrong, and we called him. And uh, one of our our product director called him directly and said, "Hey, Mr. So and So, I see you had a problem with us." He said, "One after the guy literally freaked out that we were listening, he he caught his breath and said, "Okay, I know what I did wrong." Immediately cleaned up his Facebook page, mm. but he was surprised that we saw, we heard, we made a difference, and we told him how we could correct it going forward for him. Cool. It made a huge difference, and I think it was also a huge learning for us in the organization about different ways to start thinking and looking at pieces and parts of our product differently. So, that was fantastic yeah. insights. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we've got maybe a minute to ask a couple of questions or so. I don't know if anybody on, on the floor wants to ask the panel anything about the topics today. Someone here. Be loud. <clears throat> um, so we touched on social media just a little bit a couple times, and I'm curious because in my experience, often social media um, responses require kind of a case by case resolution, a case by case solution, case by case response. Have you been able to standardize that, or develop processes, or develop you know? And it's kind of a tactical question about how you approach that piece. Um, the way we're doing it at Quest Diagnostics is we actually have a small team that's monitoring it, and typically, depending on it, on, on the question, we actually give them a phone number to call us so we could handle it. And um, because it is, we're dealing with private information, so that's typically what we do if it's something small, but we always acknowledge on there the ones we find, hey, we sorry you had a poor experience, here's a number to call, we'll take care of you. I'm really sorry, it's the end of the session. We had a very, <laughs> very uh, talkative panel, but uh, I'm sure we can take some questions uh, offline in the break. But thank you very much, everybody, for thank you. Thank you.